Hello, my beautiful babies, and welcome to Heretics of Dune Club Session 2. For this session, you need to have read pages 119 through 235 in this specific mass market paperback copy. And if you're not using this, the last sentence of the last chapter of this session is, and I hope you're prepared to kill anyone who tries to stop us. Woof, woof. So let's start off with our recap. Our story picks up the pace in session two. We fast forward a few years. Duncan and Shiana are now teenagers, and they are both continuing to cause massive rifts within the organizations around them. And I love the mirroring that's going on between these two characters. Duncan continues to learn from Lucilla and Teg at the Keep on Gamu and is becoming a force to be reckoned with. Shuang Yu and her faction's disapproval of the Gola project continues to mount until it erupts in an attack on the Keep. An amplified and prepared Teg meets the threat and he and Lucilla escape with the Gola. Meanwhile, Shiana continues to test the Church of the Divided God. High Priest Tuik continues to believe in her as their holy child, while Steros and his faction want her out. This scientific community partner with Guild, the Guild, Ix, and the Leilaxu and attempt uh, and make an attempt on Tuik and Shiana's life. Now in charge on Arrakis, Odraid cuts these plans short and takes the girl into Bene Gesserit care. So this is, we both, we have two attacks, two attempts at assassination, and we have two massive organizations who are experiencing total rifts, <laughs> total, like total disagreements about both Shiana and Duncan. I think it's, I just, like I said, I love the mirroring that goes on here. So let's go into chapter nine, study her. So it's the morning after the priests have taken Shiana into the desert and tested her by trying to feed her to Shai Halud. And she awakens and she finds herself surrounded by all these priests and priestesses. And she's like, what the fuck's going on? But she can smell the fear on them. And she senses that the order of things have changed since yesterday's trial. Uh, and I love this little moment that says Shiana would learn in time that anyone who lived through the decision to die evolved a new emotional balance. And that's definitely what happened to her. They took her out there to die. She was like, fine, fucking kill me, lived to tell about it. And now things have changed both within her and the priesthood. She has a new knight attendant named Kanya and she gives Kanya her name, which they had no idea what her name was before. And she demands that all the men in the room to be gone and call the priests haram, which is a gutter word, the lowest term for all that is most evil. And uh, in Arabic, this is a term for forbidden or unlawful. So this is an actual Arabic word that I love that she calls them haram, get them out of here. And uh, I love, Kanya's malevolent glee at the dickhead priests being labeled haram. They must have done something hideous for God to send them a child priestess to chastise them. <laughs> One of the priests outside the door, the historian locutor, which locutor is a word for announcer, Dromond, hears her name and is like, Shiana, that is a modern form of Siona. Siona Atreides, just as Odraid is a modern form of Atreides. Fun fact, really cute. And, uh, you know, he's like, Siona is the woman who served Shai Hulud in his transformation from human shape into the divided god. Uh, Siona, if you remember, Siona Atreides hatched the assassination scheme that got the god emperor killed in our last book. And he's thinking, will Shiana serve to transform the Church of the Divided God from its current form into many? This girl's dangerous. Drummond counsels the priests to study her, AKA watch this bitch, since she is obviously not about to cooperate with them on their terms. And Shiana is not just uncooperative. She disrupts their entire order by demanding that she be moved to the high priest quarters. She's like, what's the best quarters here? What's the best room? 
I like Tuik's room. She's like, well, I want Tuik's room. And so because she takes over his room, Tuik has to take the guy below him, his room, and then on down the line. And everybody has to like switch rooms because of her, which I think is fantastic and hilarious. She displaces everyone in the chain a step downward, which nobody really likes that. People don't like being going downward in the hierarchy. Tuik eventually has Dromund translated into the mouth of God, a.k.a. they fed him to a worm for his doubt in her sacred being and his assertion that they should treat Shiana like a science experiment with further tests. Shiana continues to keep secrets of her origins a mystery. She won't tell them where she came from or who she is or how the sandworm ate her family. And she tests the Church of the Divided God and finds that she has great power over them. And in the passing years, the Bene Gesserit spies have kept close watch and observe the interplay between Shiana and the church and how they are mutually teaching one another. And they're waiting for the proper moment to make their move. On to our next chapter, His Desire for Knowledge. Chapter 10. Fast forward three years on Gamu. There's a few time jumps in this session. Fast forward three years on Gamu. Duncan is now 15 and is considered a young man. And, you know, this makes sense because, you know, in our culture, we don't have a lot of um, like rituals for for manhood. You know, it's like for for girls, it's like, well, you get your period. And so you're like, oh, OK, things are different now and I can get pregnant now and like like I, I can have serious problems. You know, <laughs> like you're like, oh, OK, there's a, there's a responsibility here that I have the new I'm burdened with this new responsibility. I got to be careful. Guys don't have something that's like as similar to that. Um, that's that that altering. So like in a lot of cultures, they have these like rituals for young men. Um, and so anyways, Duncan's now considered a young man. He's like, you're a young man. And he is not only a young man, he's an angry teen. <laughs> he's pissed that his training class with Teg has been delayed and has been given uh, busy work. So he decides to rebel by making a little trip to the forbidden window. Duncan has gotten much better at sneaking around since the pillbox incident that we learned about last session and all of Shuang Yu's punishments and pain when he got caught visiting forbidden places has refined his ability to move unobserved, unseen and unheard, leaving no spore to betray his passage because the Bene Gesserit can detect tiny disturbances in minutia. On returning to his room, the Gola sits on his cot and is contemplating a blank wall in front of him when an image of a young woman forms and her silent lips saying, Duncan, my sweet Duncan. And he wonders if this is his birth mother. He's not sure who she is. She could be his mom from over 5,000 years ago. Uh, and he senses that the stranger inside him, his original Duncan memories, are familiar with is familiar with this woman and he is torn about his desire to have his original memories restored like part of him wants the knowledge but part of him is scared because that'll mean like it's a a kind of death like will this stranger just take over and what happens to me am i just gone these thoughts lead him to keep thinking about his memories or these thoughts lead him to think about his memories of dead bodies of assassins who had attempted to infiltrate the keep because there's been a lot of assassins trying to get to his ass and they had been loaded with shear. And shear is a drug that protects people from an Ixian probe, which can raid a person's mind, even if they are newly dead. And he imagines Shuang Yu reanimating corpses with some hellish Bene Gesserit magic. And he also imagines himself triumphing over the evil witches of the sisterhood one day. And his teachers sense these thoughts and they try their best to dispel them, but it's not going well. Lucilla confronts Shuang Yu about the origin of these ideas during their assessment meetings. And Shuang Yu is frustrated that Lucilla A is not going to be won over to her side. Lucilla is staunchly in Taras's camp. B, that Lucilla and Teg are imparting highly volatile abilities into this Gola. And C, that Lucilla has slowly been winning Shuang Yu's respect. And printers are going to imprint, you know, what are you going to do? She's charming. That's her whole thing. Like, Shuang Yu's like, damn it, I'm being imprinted. Uh. She admonishes Shuang Yu. Lucilla admonishes Shuang Yu for damaging the Gola in this way. 
by making him think of them as witches and like wanting to triumph over them. And Shuang Yu takes responsibility for this. She's like, yeah, you know, uh, I was hoping that, you know, he would try to run away and that we'd have to hunt him down and kill him. So then we don't have to do any more Gola time. But Lucilla is fighting back by bonding the boy to her, by treating him with candor and loyalty as she would any Bene Gesserit acolyte. The only teaching or experience that will be denied to him is the spice agony. So, I mean, they are treating him like he is, she is treating him like he is a sister, a, an acolyte sister, one of their own, giving him the whole works. And I love that, like, it's like, how, how are you bonding him? It's like, because I just, I'm cool with him. I treat him with candor and respect. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, it's not rocket science here. Uh, Shuang Yu asks Lucilla about the time of the ultimate imprinting, AKA sex, and states that there's a lot of sisters who are not down with this Gola scheme. And she's worried about what the Leiloxu have secretly done with this Gola. And we know that she's right about that. I mean, Waf has said like mysterious things in past chapters, like, oh, well, we've got our Gola over there and we've like put something in him and we don't know what that is yet. Um, and Shuang Yu also states that she will not be removed from her post. Opposition has its place and she's going to stay here. And Lucilla claps back with remove you. Certainly not. I don't want your faction sending us sending someone unknown to us, which I was like, oh, that's so great. That's such a good comeback, Lucilla. And she follows by warning the older woman that there's only so much treachery that will be accepted and that she gives zero fucks about her fears of awakening another Kwisatz Haderach and has, in fact, begun increasing the Gola's intake of spice. And Shuangyu's like, oh my God, we're, we're going to have a quiz that's had her. You better stop giving him so much spice, you crazy bitch. She's like, I'm giving him more spice. You better deal with it. Chapter 11, Expanding Worship. Another fast forward to Shiana's fourth year with the Church of the Divided God. She's now 12. And Tamalane, who was one of Duncan's teachers in a former chapter, she is on Rackus spying on this whole situation. The Bene Gesserit have a woman on the inside named Kapuna. They have a few women on the inside, but their main, their main bitch is Kapuna, who is a Reikian native, priestess of the church, but also a Bene Gesserit acolyte. And she is recounting the latest goings-on goings -ons to the Reverend Mother. Shiana has recently accept, ordered two lowly prisoners to be taken into, or who were being taken into the desert for translation by Thopter. She's like, no, 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 bring them back. <laughs> bring them back, fellas. They're not going anywhere. And uh, when they finally come back and she speaks to them, she tells them, you are my people, and orders the church to bathe them, give them new clothes, and to release them. The girl then summons Tuik. Uh, and tells them to stop feeding people to Shaitan. Like, please, just, you, she didn't even say please. She's like, stop feeding people to the worms. Okay, please. Tam is cracking up that Shiana keeps calling their god Shaitan, a thing uh, which the god emperor did predict. He said, in the future, they will call me Shaitan. And so the church will now have to stop sacrificing people using worms as instruments of punishment. But instead, they're, you know, they're still going to punish people. So they're going to up the whippings and like the water deprivation. So they're just going to switch to those things and do a lot more of that. Tamlane sends her report back to Chapter House and they see how Shiana is becoming a powerful religious force on Rackus. Through her actions, this child of Shai Halud has single-handedly erased the people's fear of Shaitan, while increasing their fear of the priesthood, wresting their power away from the church and onto herself. The Bene Gesserit artists in mythology have been feeding the Shiana myth by seeding the populace with phrases like, Shiana is the one we have long awaited, and the child of Shai Halud comes to chastise the priests. I love that the BG are out there like, oh, yeah, the child of Shai Halud comes to chastise the priests. And then people are like, yeah, 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 yeah. And they're spreading this message around, and it's working. Like, their PR is totally working. They are stoking people's hatred of the church. And this has resulted in a few dead priests in some alleyways. And which predictably, because priests have started dying, like people have been just like taking them down. Uh, the church cops have, uh, you know, increased the predictable injustices inflicted upon the populace for these killings. 
Steros, one of the higher ups in the priesthood, is pissed about all of these changes and intrudes upon Shiana one day when she's just trying to have lunch with some rando street child uh, who witnesses all of this mess, by the way, and will spread the word to all the people. And Tamala, Tamalane has eyes and ears on this whole debacle. Steros is arguing with Shiana about his sacrifices to Shai Halud. And she is quick to correct his sandworm terminology to Shaitan, not Shai Halud, Shaitan, and explains the worm can be inhabited by God or the devil or both. And this goes against everything Steros believes in. And in the past, he's sent people for translation for speaking such heresy. He's killed people for saying this. Tamalane is happy to see that the pot is boiling nicely at the Church of the Divided God, and Shiana's disruption is casting doubts in the priesthood that go all the way up to the high priest Tuik, who wonders if he made the right decision with Drummond by killing him. He's like, should they doubt her? His yes men are like, no, you did the, you totally did the right thing. You totally should have killed him. She's the holy child because they're yes men. That they, they can't say anything else. And so Steros is like, yeah, we we should we should doubt her for sure. Like we should definitely doubt her. <laughs> but uh, he goes with his yes man, of course, because it feels better to feel like you're right. And Tam has a full account of Tuik and Steros' most recent debate. Steros tries to persuade Tuik into testing her uh, so that he can find a way to get rid of her. While Tuik expresses his doubts about his faith, Shiana has stirred questions in him, like why would God divide? Is he testing us to see the good and evil and the evil and good? And Steros is fucking mortified. If the high priest goes public with these ideas, it's gonna upend their authority over everybody. Like, oh no, Steros has got to find a way to steer Tuik away from this shit. And if he can't, he is ready to translate his boss. Lucky for Tuik, Steros is able to gently persuade him to allow the priests to learn from her by secretly bugging her clothing so that they can listen in when she goes to the desert and talks to God, hoping, he's secretly hoping that she's going to say something that he can use to disinherit her position of power and get rid of her. Sturo starts annoying her and gets her homesick. And so she, she's just like, this guy sucks, you know? And uh, she's like, I want to go back to my place. So she has to be taken to the desert on several occasions. And most often she goes to the place of her lost village. Although the church doesn't know that this is the place of her lost village. They have no idea why she goes to this particular spot. And, um, but even though they don't get it, the Bene Gesserit have sussed it out. They're like, oh, yeah, she probably came from some fucking desert place and the worm fucking ate her home and like that's where her home is like they're totally they figured it out on these trips she summons the worms and speaks with them not knowing she's been bugged but she never gives herself away either on one trip she says i should hate you and steros narrowly avoids to starting an open debate should all of us hate the divided god at the same time that we love him tamalane cracks up when shiana asks if she should punish it, when Shiana asks the worm if she should punish the bad priests and notes that the girl has learned an effective command, go away, which works like a charm, because if the divided God obeys this, then who in the church, who are they to disobey? If Shaitan listens to her and he goes, and he goes away when she tells him, then they better fucking do it too. And because the priesthood want more places to observe the girl on her outings. When she goes into the desert, they start building these towers, which the Bene Gesserit are secretly helping along. They're like, yes, build these towers. So they're like secretly like making the projects go smoother. And um, these are like totally self-sustaining desert towers. Like they're like little villages in these towers. And this development is spreading civilization in a more secure fashion than those shitty pioneer settlements like the one that Shiana came from. So that makes those sort of dangerous settlements no longer um, feet, or, uh, no longer necessary. And so the people love Shiana for this. They're like, oh man, she is our priestess. Because of her, we're getting these cool towers. We don't have to be in these shitty pioneer towns. And Steros is between a rock and a worm place. He is terrified that Tuik is going to undermine their power by announcing that Shai Tan and Shai Halu live in one body. But his conspirators reject the idea of assassinating Tuik or Shiana, lest God visit them with an even more terrible intrusion, citing the oldest books say that a little child shall lead us. 
there is a growing, even though she's like totally giving them hell, there is a growing affection for Shiana. And Steros is so confounded that he can't even believe that she's mortal. Tuik and Kanya have come to love her. And the people are starting to pray to her instead of the worms because she intercedes for the weakest people, like those people that she saved in the Thopter. The Bene Gesserit know a label for this ancient effect. It's called expanding worship. Everything is going according to plan. And Tamlane wants to know, when are you guys going to send that Gola out here? On to <laughs> chapter 12, we allowed ourselves to be taken. Man, this is such a good chapter. Shit is heating up. Miles tag on Gamu. He's been called up to a guild transport that's orbiting the planet by Taraza. And her message has secretly warned him that he needs to be prepared for violence. His gut is telling him that the vibes are off and something's gone wrong here on Gamu. And our man, he is 100% prepared for combat. He is taken inside the Ixian guild ship. So even the guild are buying ships from Ix trying to say to Leiloxu, like, we don't totally need you and your spice. Like, we have some ships that we don't need navigators for. And everything seems normal on the ship until he enters Taraz's quarters and notices the smell of sheer, a signal letting him know that there is an unwelcome observer. They're afraid of being taken and being probed. The Reverend Mother Superior enters and confirms his warning. She greets him using one of their secret words. Uh, your quick response is appreciated. And the, when she uses the word appreciated, she really means we are being watched secretly by a dangerous foe. That's so cool. It's such a simple trick, but it's like so effective and super neat. She goes on to tell him that they must awaken the Gola at the first opportunity, even though he's a bit too young, but circumstances require it. Taraza gives him another secret signal when she flexes her left wrist while she orders him to awaken Duncan to confirm that she is actually giving him a real order and not just pantomiming for their unwanted guest. She goes on to warn him that uh, desperate attempts will be made to kill the Gola before he can be awakened. And Teg in Mintat mode surmises that the Leiloxu are playing a power game with these Duncans. They are using these Golas to drain the Bene Gesserit of their melange, one, because they have to pay for them in melange. And it's like, Leilox who have so much, but like they know the Bene Gesserit only have a finite amount. And so they're trying to drain uh, drain their, their spice stores. And they are killing these Golas to control this Gola scheme's timing. A prime pattern emerges in his thinking and he realizes that Gamu has become a banking hub of enormous wealth and not just wealth of the Imperium, but wealth from the people of the scattering, wealth with a, with a capital W. And realizing this, he crosses the room to a concealed entry, whips some hangings aside and finds their unwelcome guest. And the man is surprised and Teg just smiles at him and lets the curtain fall back. He like, he like does this and then just smiles at him and then just like puts the curtain back like you idiot and then walks back. Such a boss move. Uh, he returns to Terraza and announces, we are being observed by people of the scattering. And Terraza is very pleased with his performance. The stranger joins them quite miffed. And I love that he's just like standing behind some curtains. Like, what is, like, he's just uh, <laughs> like, oh, what a fucking secret spot, dude. The stranger joins them quite miffed, upset that Tag figured out what was going on. And uh, he starts warning them like, I'm in control here, fellas. And Tag lets him know that no, you are not in control of shit. And right now at this very moment, I've got two no ships uh, trained on this ship. You know, we got you, we got us in their sights. And he clenches his jaw and activates a pulsa timer in his skull, which displays its countdown against his visual centers and lets the man know that he better make a quick decision or they will all be blown to hell. So he, that's so crazy. He's got like a little thing, a little timer. He clicks it, 
on his tooth and then it like and then you can see the timer in his eye it's like oh that's so dope and then he's like yeah so uh you better figure it out dude like i'll take you with me miles then explains that he and the mother superior have their own secret means of communicating uh but that her calling but he didn't even need all that her calling him up here at this odd time was enough for him to know that something was up and, uh, you know, forget about your ix and your guild backing you up right now because they wouldn't dare go up against a student of the Bashar, uh, Burzmali, who's out there right now. And Taraza tells him, you have just witnessed the powers of a mintat. <laughs> how do you like that? <laughs> like, how do you like them apples? Fucking scattering bitch. Ted goes on, uh, the Reverend Mother Superior and her entourage, uh, they, they come with me or we're all going to die. So you better figure it out like right now. Like you better choose like me and me and her going and, and her people. And uh, at first the man thinks they're bluffing and Teg tells Teraza, it's been such an honor to serve you. And she gives him a traditional farewell of a Reverend Mother to a sister equal. Perhaps death will not part us. Like, oh. So the oh, this is so cute. I love that she respects him like his sister. And the dude is like, okay, okay, get the fuck out of here, guys. All right, all right, bye. Teraza gets her homegirls, including Odrade. And uh, and then she introduces each one of them to Miles, who nods and grasps each of the woman's hands as they are presented. And uh, and they're just doing this so calmly. And it's like, this is like such a tense situation. And this guy thinks like these people should be terrified right now and trying to hurry to get off this ship. But like they're taking their fucking time. And Miles tells him, one must always observe the niceties. Otherwise, we are less than human. He's just like such a cool customer, totally unafraid, uh, taking their sweet time. Um, and let's see here. Uh, on the lighter, back down to Gamu. Teg finally asks Taraza, what the fuck? How were you taken? And she tells him this was all part of their plan. And she's like, I wanted to be taken. Okay, we, we we made this happen. And she knew, she's like, I knew you would rescue me. And if you didn't, Burz Molly is over there. So he would do it if like if you couldn't do it. But she goes on to compliment him on his ability to understand both sides of opposing forces and how he has the ability to help them see things that they have no other way of seeing. He helps the Bene Gesserit. Uh, understand things from from other perspectives that they can't seem to grasp. Meanwhile, Teg is observing Adraid and finds himself disturbed. There's something about her and Lucilla that reminds him of someone, but he can't quite put his finger on it. Taraza again brings up the Gola and asks if he has the ability to be a Mintat and expresses the absolute necessity to awaken him. All right, so, and what sort of hell is that? Death will not separate us. That's like, you know, with Reverend Mothers, they have like other memories too. So it's like, well, maybe I'll see you in my other memory. Maybe we'll see each other in somebody else's other memories. It's totally chill. You know, we're, we was as fucking, we're fine, dude. On to our next chapter, The Key Log, chapter 13. So Odrade is chilling. She's just resting her eyes on their descent down to Gamu. And she's thinking about Teg and how he has no idea how many memories of him she possesses in her other memory. Memories that would make it easy for her to love this old guy. That damnable, weakening love. You know how the Bene Gesserit, they're like, oh, love is the worst. We gotta like, <laughs> we can't, no, no, no love. And she thinks back on the time when she felt that tug to love somebody else, uh, that time with the first mate that she had been sent to seduce by the breeding mothers. She had been carefully prepared by the breeding mistresses and conditioned against love. And she's just like trained for like the hottest sex, like the hottest. And she remembers how unprepared she was for the ecstasy of a simultaneous orgasm, the absolute vulnerability of her partner in that moment, feeling his essence in her deepest fibers, something never experienced with the training males at their stables at the Bene Gesserit chapter house. And for just a moment, 
She too abandons herself, experiencing a height of pleasure that makes her understand just what happened to Lady Jessica. She's like, oh, I see. I see why she fell in love with this. Okay, I get it. I totally get it now. But then she catches herself. She goes back into the calculating Bene Gesserit sex goddess mode. The man does not see through her act and responds as expected. And uh, I love the line. It helped to think of him as stupid. <laughs> and nobody else in all of her many seductions ever hit her that deep. This is the dangerous power of love. It clouded reason. It diverted sisters from their duties. It is only tolerated when it serves a larger purpose of the Bene Gesserit and causes no disruptions. Otherwise, it is to be strictly avoided. And this is too, it's interesting because this is a test. Like the breeding mistresses know that this first seduction is generally going to like really wake them up. Because again, the training males, the men that they train with, they don't abandon themselves in the same manner. They're very professional about it. You know, they're, they're pros. <laughs> they're not they're not showing that ultimate vulnerability to them so that when it happens to these women they they learn a lesson and they see what happens but hopefully their training kicks in like it did with Odraid and like it did with Lucilla she she also thinks about her first mate later on another cool mirroring in this session um but uh Odraid begins listening to Taraza's conversation with Miles and Taraza is hitting him with a lot of different concepts. She's really, she's playing her uh, mentat with a fine hand. A, she is talking to him about dis dependency infrastructures that are required for civilization. Uh, and I love that Miles and Odrade are both losing patience with her. Like he, she's talking to him about elementary shit that like he's like, I know about dependency infrastructures. I understand what that is. Like, why, why are you talking to me about this? But she's got, there's a point, there's a method to her, her madness here. She then goes into hydraulic despotism, which is central control of an essential energy such as water, electricity, fuel, or medicine. Obey the central controlling power or the energy is shut off and you die. So you have these dependency infrastructures that are created to sustain civilization, to expand civilization, but then those things can quickly be misused uh, for hydraulic despotism from the central controlling uh, power. And then she kind of switches gears and goes into the key log and explains that back in the day, you would have loggers and they would cut down all these trees and then they would put them in a river and the river would carry these logs down to the logging factory where they would like take them out of the water and then they would saw them and turn them into whatever logs, <laughs> turn, turn them into whatever wood stuff for people to build out of. So every now and again, there would be a jam, a log jam. And uh, it would be like, oh, no, everything's all fucked up. We got we got to we got to unclog this river. And so they'd call in a guy who would find that one log that needed to be destroyed, that needed to be moved. And when that log, the key log, was destroyed and taken out of the way, then the flow would go, you know, it would, the dam would be removed. They also say that, uh, she talks about the God Emperor was a key log, you know, he created, he dammed up society for a long time. And then when he left, when the key log was gone, everything started flowing again. Then she goes into belief structures. Humans have such a powerful need that their own belief structure must be the true belief. If it gives you pleasure and a sense of security, and if it is incorporated into your belief structure, what a powerful dependency that creates. So now she's going into belief structures, but then talking about, again, dependencies. And all of this talk is just leading up to the real talk, the problem of the honored matres. Taraza is directing Tegdiz's ability to understand both sides of this opposing force. You have the honored matres, and then you have the Bene Gesserit. And she feeds her Bashar with data, telling him that the honored matres have combined sexual ecstasy and worship, which is a dangerous combination. These women place themselves at the center of worship, which is a real no-no 
according to the Bene Gesserit. And then she shocks him off track with a seemingly tangential topic of tooth decay, which I liked this little tangent talking about how in the Dune universe, people don't deal with tooth decay anymore because they just put a little implant at birth and then like, you still have to brush your teeth, but you, you'll never have to worry about tooth decay, which is like, wow, that sounds awesome. Um, and then she asks him, after talking about tooth decay, she asks him, find the flaw in these honored matres. And what is the danger that they represent? And Miles uh, clicks into Mintat mode and he sees the pattern. Honored matres are combining sexual addiction with belief structures to create a dependency infrastructure with which they wield uh, their hydraulic despotism with, or that they use for their hydraulic despotism, and that these women are like parasites who feed off of their host until the host dies, leading to their own mutual destruction. I mean, there's different types of parasites and some of them like will like coexist with you. They want you to stay alive because they want to stay alive. But then there's other like wild parasites who like, they'll just feed off of you until you die. But then when you die, like they die. So it's like really stupid. So that's what these honor matres are like. They're turning uh, humanity, they're feeding off humanity in such a way that it could take everybody down with them. Terraza warns Miles and Odrade of the very powerful elements the Bene Gesserit are setting adrift in the human current. And these elements may jam up like the logs. And they are definitely but they're and they're definitely gonna fuck some shit up for sure. But they have to be prepared to find that key log and move it if things get stuck. Moving on to chapter 14. I am one of your daughters. This is such a great chapter. The gang touches down on Gamu and they arrive at the keep and Teg is shaken up by all these recent revelations and oh, he's like, oh fuck, you know, like he just, he just been through a lot today. He, he had to get called up to a lighter. He had to be prepared for violence. He had to do a face off with a man from the scattering. He saved the mother superior and her people. Now she's like been schooling him in this lighter, you know, and like, and uh, like all these new revelations are happening. And he's perceiving this planet as a strange place. He's like, I thought I knew this place and it looks very alien to me right now. He reflects on the Bene Gesserit influence on the people of Gamu. And he wonders at the purpose of the obvious breeding scheme that's utilizing the Atreides genotype on this planet. Specifically, the visible emphasis on seductive eyes for women. So the Bene Gesserit are so scheming that they've got a whole population on this planet with like seductive eyes, which is like, man, their influence is so pervasive. And Teg himself has the Gamu look, as does Lucilla and Odrade. And he thinks to himself, you could drown in the right type of eyes. He has learned, <laughs> hold on, let me, let me start this over. Okay. You could drown in the right kind of eyes, he had learned. Sink right into them and be unaware of what was being done to you until penis was firmly clasped in vagina. <laughs> I like laughed really hard at that line. Yes, yes, he's learned. This is a hard lesson that he has learned, no pun intended. Many things happen once they enter the keep. Lucilla and Odrade finally confront each other because they both heard about each other. And they know they're kind of like, they look really similar and sound very similar. So it was fun for them to kind of be like, oh, hey, I've heard about you. Weird. Ew, we are like. Shuang Yu comes down surprised that Terraza has shown up out of the blue. And uh, Terraza goes off with Lucilla for a private word and a moment to watch the Gola unobserved. And then Odrade turns Shuang Yu's lunch invitation down. Uh, go fuck yourself. I don't want to eat lunch with you. And spends a moment alone with Teg. And uh, he offers her a place with chair dogs. But she, just like Miles, she also hates chair dogs and says that I hate it when they try to cuddle me. <laughs> Which I'm just, again, I'm just thinking like a chair trying to cuddle you. It's like so fucking weird. I kind of think I, I would try it. I would try it. I don't know. It might be too weird though. Dar takes Miles' arm. They go. Uh, on a walk while they chat and she opens by commenting on their shared Atreides heritage and then recounts the time his mother explained his ancestry to him it's like oh yeah I remember when you uh when you got back from school that first time 
and your mom told you that you were in a tradies and miles is like how does she know this like what how do you know about that Audrey then recounts a conversation she had uh, with a woman that he bedded her birth mother because she's one of his daughters oh my god Audrey is miles tag's daughter what a surprise i really love this this is so good and it's like can you imagine like she's like sitting there like saying this shit that he told her mom when like they were in bed you know and like again it's so fucked it's like wow you can remember you know your dad like like boning your mom you know it's just like it's so nuts <laughs> it's just it's, it's so much and it is also revealed that lucilla isn't directly related to either of them but she's from a parallel breeding line so she's not one of adrade's daughters she's like from a whole separate atreides uh, line that they have oh and and here's here's another thing tag uh you know, I know you've been through a lot today, but I also wrote the Atreides Manifesto at Terrazzo's orders. And he's just like, what, what, what? This keeps coming. And there will come a time, Tag, when you will understand our purpose. And Terraza wants you to make your own decision at that moment. Uh, and that you can finally become the free agent that you've always longed to be. We're not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you when that moment is or what it's going to look like. But when you get there, you're going to know it. And then you get to decide and we'll let you. We're just going to put it in your hands. And Teg is just like shook. Teg is very shook here. And he thinks about how Reverend Mothers are just not quite human and that they move outside of humanity. And he realizes that Terraza is expecting him to make a human decision for the entire Bene Gesserit order. Odraid is proud of her quick-witted father for figuring this out, uh, but he shoots her down, asking if she really does have a father. I was like, do you really have a dad? Which I was like, oh, that's that's mean, Ted, come on. And then he's like, you know, you. I think you guys just put on a conscious act to appear human. I mean, like the way you're holding my arm right now, it makes, it's like as though you were really my daughter. Um, but like, you know, you're missing some fundamental component and you're not one of us anymore and i was like man he just really i mean i can see why he'd be annoyed though i mean he had to <laughs> like she just like fucked him up with like a lot of revelations so i can see why he'd be he'd be a little grumpy and would kind of take it out on her and she knew that he was going to react this way but it still hurts her feelings she still has feelings and it's like he isn't wrong about the sisterhood but he is wrong about her. Audrey does still feel her humanity inside her. And while Lucilla and Terraza walk up to the pair, Audrey casts her mind back to this painting in Terraza's office, the cottages at Cordville, painted by Vincent Van Gogh, that hangs, uh, you know, in Chapter House. And this painting has been expertly preserved by the Ixians. It's one of the few artifacts from earth that has remained and there's this little dark spot on the lower left corner of the frame and that when you touch it it's something called a sense projector and it comes online and then you can feel the movements used to paint this painting like it simulates like and you can feel what it was like to paint this painting which is so weird and amazing and like i like what an idea and odrade has gone on this ride so many times she's touched the center projector and sat there and done this painting ride so many times that she feels like she could recreate this image and she realizes she's like what am i thinking Fuck, what am i thinking about this right now but she realizes she's thinking about it because tag has challenged her humanity and when she goes on the Van Gogh ride, she feels human and she feels like that human presence uh, and she becomes emotional at these thoughts and has to kind of turn away and like wipe her eye real quick. And Tag notices this and is shocked to see real tears in her eyes. She's not faking it. She's got feelings in there. And Terraza then sends Odraid on her way to Rackus officially. On to chapter 15. This child is my canvas. So it's been around six years since Shiana has come into the Church of the Divided God. She's around 14 now. And much like the Bene Gesserit, 
The church is also experiencing a divide with high priest Tuik believing in Shiana as a sacred child and Sturos and his scientific faction want her out. And Tuik knows that he's walking a fine line and may be assassinated by this faction. Sturos and Tuik go round and round arguing about Shiana in private. Um, and we get, a, it's cute because we finally get like a little bit of the scripture and the belief system of the church. We don't like talk about it. He doesn't talk about it a lot, but here's like some little tidbits where they talk about the holy triumvirate of heaven, which is like the holy trinity comparable to the, our holy trinity, like the father, the son, and the holy ghost. But they have the Reverend Mother Jessica, Muadib, and Leto the second. And I love that Steros is like Leto the third. What about the child killed by the Sardaukar? You know, he's such a little troll. He's like, well, it was Leto the Third, actually. And to it's like, my great grandfather already explained this. Leto the Second was killed and then reincarnated with part of him remaining in heaven to mediate the ascendancy. And this part is nameless as the true essence of God is nameless. <laughs> I just, I loved like their explanations of these things. Like they've like figured out ways to like make things work. I, I enjoyed hearing about that a lot. And after their argument, Tuik goes to visit Shiana on the roof, who's doing some finger flexing exercises with Kapuna. And Tuik knows she's a Bene Gesserit spy, but like, you know, like everybody on Rackus spies for someone. So like, whatever. But he hates that it's like so obvious. He's like, at least try to be like chill about it. Like, come on, Kapuna. Shiana likes the old man. She likes Tuik, but she just, she loves to troll him. She lives to troll. And she uh, is always asking him shit like, why do you believe this? She learns that this is like a really great response to like fuck people up in the church. Why do you believe this? Why? And then she loves to give him probing stares. She knows that this disquiets him. She just looks at him. <laughs> it's because he's like, is that God looking at me through her eyes? Like he gets all like flustered because he's like, maybe God is looking at me through her. And they briefly converse about the fish speakers. She's been asking about them who are now a co-ed organization, mostly working as an arm of Ix. And uh, they talk about the Duncans before she changes the subject and asks him about the Bene Gesserit. Uh, and she asks about this using his first name, Headley or Headley, which can be interpreted as both demeaning, because he's the high priest. She shouldn't be calling him by his first name. But then at the same time, it could be considered an honor because she's like, if she is a holy, like really a holy child, like call him by his first name, like that's like, oh, it's very intimate. So it's like, it's the perfect troll for him. She demands that he brings Odraid, the new Reverend Mother in charge of their embassy to her and Tuik is sweating it. He's like, I can't order the Benny Jesuit to do nothing. Like, what am I gonna do? But then he's like, you know what? Let's just fucking, I'm gonna pass this ball to Kapuna. She's one of these fucking Bene Gesserits. Uh, and Kapuna's like, yeah, I'll try my best. <laughs> and, um, but wait, fuck. Kapuna sees something glinting in the sun and she grabs Shiana and tosses her like a ball to Tuik, who catches her thanks to his days of playing bat ball. And uh, he's now seeing the danger. There is a seeker trailing a long length of Shiga wire. And he dashes them through the door uh, to the stairs with Ka Kanya right behind them, slamming it shut. But not before Kanya has witnessed Kapuna and the two of Tuik's guards killed. Kapuna's head is cut off by the sugar wire. It loops around and just garrots her head right off. Not trusting the chute or the suspensor drop system. Uh, no elevators for them. The three make their way down the stairs and hear an uproar coming down from the roof and the door crashing open. They duck into a hallway and run right into Odraid and a wedge of Reverend Mothers who spirit Shiana away to safety while Odraid questions Tuik and Kanya. When the battle is over, they go to Shiana, who is in her quarters. Steros's dead body is slumped in the corner. Steros has been betrayed by his co-conspirators, the Leilaxu, the Guild, and Ix. So he was trying to kill Tuik and Shiana, but, you know, it came back and bit him in the ass. Odraid and Shiana finally interact, and Dar feels the same wild fires of inspiration towards this child that she feels went into the Van Gogh painting, feeling how Van Gogh painted this painting and the wild inspiration that went into that. She's just feeling that same deal. And 
She thinks this child is my canvas. I'm ready and gets to work. She orders everyone out, including Tuik and Kanya, displaying the power of the voice for Shiana in the process, taking charge and telling them they may or may not even get to see their holy child anymore. And telling the girl, uh, she, he tells, she tells her how long that the Bene Gesserit have waited for her and how they will not give these fools another opportunity to lose her. On to our next chapter, chapter 16. She has amplified me. I really did enjoy the, uh, the little header for this chapter. Law always chooses side on the basis of enforcement power. Morality and legal niceties have little to do with it when the real question is, who has the clout? <laughs> I don't know if any of you are watching Secession, but there's like a whole thing where the government is like, looking into them and like all oh, this stuff and like are people going to go to jail and then it's like they use their leverage and their clout and they kind of like pretty much get out of it and like it doesn't turn into a huge nightmare like they were like thinking that it might because again it's like who has the clout and they had some leverage so anyways let's go into the chapter it has been two days since Teraza came and left gamu and to overcome all the wild revelations He's thrown, Teg has thrown himself into his work, fortifying the keep and keeping Shuang Yu at arm's length from the Gola. He's in a daze, he's in his workroom. He's having trouble remembering that he's like, what day is it? What fucking time is it? Shit. And he can't just click back into Mentat mode like he usually can. And, uh, and this stirs him to think back onto a memory of him and Teraza, and they had just prevented a potentially really bloody confrontation. And they're both really tired. They've been up for like 30 hours. And so she hooks them up with this Bene Gesserit pick-me-up spice beverage. And this is like only for insiders. Like they don't offer this to just anybody. And she has dropped all of the Bene Gesserit masks and all the crap. And she's just being a cool homie. She's not even trying to seduce him. She's just like being a friend. And she gives him some high praise for a job well done and says she reacts to him like she would a sister. Like she really does consider him essentially like a male Bene Gesserit. Like that's, and it's just, it's so rare. That's not something that happens. And he tells her that like his daughter, Demela, thinks that he's too much like a reverend mother. You know, like even his daughter sees it in him. And they discuss the spice and its effects of extending lives and how in some people it produces a profound knowledge of human nature. And Miles is like chalking it up. He's like, well, you just have more life experience. So, you know, you get more, you get more profound knowledge of human nature. And Charles is like, eh, I don't know about that. I don't think it's quite that simple. Some people never observe anything. Life just happens to them. They get by on little more than a kind of dumb persistence and they resist with anger and resentment, anything that might lift them out of that false serenity. Oh, what a quote. That was a really good one. I really like that one a lot. They then discuss life before the spice and how short people's lives were. You know, people lived 50, maybe 100 years. And Miles asks if humanity compressed more into the available time. And she dips into her other memories and she says, Oh, they were frenetic at times. And I just like, that's such a great way to encapsulate it. Like, I feel like, yes, we are very frenetic at times. Absolutely. And as their conversation turns philosophical, Terraza compliments Teg on his ability to doubt an essential component of a philosopher. Not many mentats dabble in philosophy. And she gives him an insight into the Bene Gesserit and how those who survived the spice agony achieve this exalted form of Satori involving every cell of their body. And we talked a little bit about Satori in session one, which is a Zen Buddhist term for enlightenment, awakening to one's true nature. But there's like there's like different levels of it. There's like Kansho, which is kind of like like a beginner's level. And then but then like Satori is like you've like achieved like Buddhahood. Like you, like you got it. And so she's like, yeah, we, we get that with every cell in our bodies, which is, which is pretty intense and an insight. Um, and then she also gives him an insight into the deadliness of prescience and how it made Muad'Dib and Lita the second's life 
an unutterable bore. Because if they know the future, they know everything that's going to happen to them and there are no surprises. And so your life fucking sucks. And how they spent their lives trying to break those chains that they had created for themselves. She goes on leading her mentat into thinking about the dangers of belief and how belief shapes uh, distorted perceptions of the universe. Everything gets filtered through your beliefs. And so you don't have an accurate perception of the true universe. And like all of a sudden, Ted, oh, he comes to him. He comes back to himself. He's back in his workroom. Uh, he was taking a little trip down memory lane and he finds that he feels restored from the memory of the drink that he had. Like he just had this memory of a drink and he's just like, oh, I feel better. Like just the memory, the smell, remembering the smell of this drink, I feel better. And now he can kind of like easily go in and out of Mentat mode. And calling up that old memory created a magical universe where his abilities were amplified beyond his wildest expectations. No atoms existed in that magical universe, only waves and awesome movement all around. He was forced here to discard all barriers built of belief and understanding. This universe was transparent. He could see through it without any interfering screens upon which to project its forms. The magical universe reduced him to a core of active imagination where his own image making abilities were the only screen upon which any projections might be sensed. He thinks to himself, I am both the performer and the performed. And he felt his awareness constricted to its tightest purpose. And yet that purpose filled his universe and he was open to infinity. And like, just thinking about all this stuff is like, he's achieved, I would say Kancha, I wouldn't say it's a Satori, but he's like, this whole like remembering this and everything that's happened to him, like it's just like clicked into place. And now he's had a moment of enlightenment. And he thinks to himself, uh, Taraza has amplified me. And she, she has, Tech has definitely leveled up with Taraza's help. And he realizes that Taraza is doing this because she needs a fearful performance from him. She needs him at the tippy top of his game. And it's interesting because Teg really is like a reverend mother. Like he can't necessarily go into like his ancestral memories. Like he can't go into his other memories, but he can throw himself back into his own memories. How many people can just like send themselves back and like replay like a fucking memory like that? Like that's very, like that's very much reverend mother stuff. And um, Taraza from the past and the present has led Miles, you know, to his own type of Satori. And it's like, and it's, he's born of a reverend mother. Like, he, he's not just born, like, like, Paul was born from Jessica, who was not a reverend mother at the time. You know, she was just like, oh, I'm Bene Gesserit. But like, she wasn't like, oh, I have my other memory. And there's something like, like, the babies that reverend mothers produce are like, sometimes get these you know reverend mother like abilities and he definitely has a lot of that going on for himself yeah limited knowledge he's like a reverend father <laughs> miles tag is a, a reverend father he's the, i think he's like one of the closest you know you can get to it you know um chapter 17 time for the whip time for the whip Another great header. The basic rule is this. Never support weakness. Always support strength. From the Bene Gesserit. And that feeds right into this chapter. Odrade has set up a command center in Shiana's quarters. And she's wondering at the odd shape of this room. She begins studying it. Looking around. And Shiana's being really bratty. She's demanding to know what Odrade is doing. And Odrade's like, please shut up. Like, I'm studying the room. Like, just, can you just shut the fuck up for a minute? And they have a really funny interaction during this. Uh, and she starts even trolling Odrade. She tells her, this was, this was Headley's room. And Odrade asks Shiana, why do you annoy him by using his first name, child? And she's like, does that annoy him? And Odrade's like, don't play word games with me, child. You know it annoys him. And that's why you do it. And Shiana's like, then why do you ask? Like, you know why I'm doing, like, you, why, why you even ask me, bitch? You know. And I was like, oh, man, Shiana is going to be such trouble. Odrade figures out that this room has been constructed so that even a whisper can be heard by someone beyond the ventilator. And she signals to an acolyte, little hand signals, find out who is listening 
but let them continue for now until we figure out who are who they're reporting to, and then we'll kill them. Odrade assesses the girl, seeing corrections are going to have to be made immediately. We got to put this little weirdo in her place. We got to teach her patience. We got to curb that vindic- vindictive streak. She's definitely too interested in punishment. Hatred is as dangerous an emotion as love. The capacity for one is the capacity for the other. And I mean, isn't that so true? Like the people that you love the most are the ones that can make you the most angry a lot of times. Like, it's just like, it's it's, a, it's two sides of the same coin for sure. At Shiana's prodding, Odrade tells her that they have sent the Leiloxu, the Guild, and Ix the message they always send when they are annoyed. You will pay. <laughs> I love that. I love that. They just send them, you will pay. You're going to pay. And they're, you know, it's just like, oh, man, these guys are going to be so fucking sad and scared. A reverend mother enters with a silent hand message from Terraza outlining a plan to fuck up the guild and Ix and the fish speakers, but that the real catch is to trap the Leiloxu master of masters who is coming to Rackus. Shiana continues to act like a petulant child, trying to command Odrade around, yeah, right, who lets her know real quick that unlike the priests, she isn't afraid of her. I'm not afraid of you, kid. And Shiana respects that. She's like, good. But then she still pushes, insisting that Odrade teach her everything. Time for the whip. Odrade busts out the voice on her. Don't take that tone with me, child. Not if you wish to learn anything. And Shiana goes rigid, and it takes her a minute to relax. But then once she's relaxed, she's like, holy shit, yes, I am so glad you came. It has been so boring lately. Wow, Shiana is just on in a league all of her own. She is such a crazy little troll. On to our next chapter. Tag is not tag. Back on Gamma. Lucilla is watching Duncan practice the old Bene Gesserit eightfold combat, plus some shit Teg taught him and making up some new tricks of his own. And his speed is dazzling. She's accomplished the first stage of her imprint, grooming the Gola to love her in a motherly way. And she's done it without making him a simp. And now, pretty soon, it's going to be time for the sexual imprint on Terraza's orders, and she's ready to do her duty. She's even been practicing, you know, in the mirror, how hot she's gonna look, you know, and she has this prehistoric love goddess thing that she's like working on. But the thing is, she's not thrilled about this seduction because he is not quite 16 yet. And uh, she's not really looking forward to imprinting on somebody that young. I mean, she's gonna do it, but it's kind of (laughs) gross. On the other hand, on the other hand, She was thinking about fucking someone old. There was a moment when she was planning to seduce Teg and conceive his child, but he figured out what she was up to real quick and let her know, my breeding days are over, sis. Y'all should be glad with what I have already given. Now go away. Teg is so based. (laughs) Miles Tech is the most based character in all of Dune. And at first she's like, I still could. Like, I feel like I could make this happen if I really tried. But He's been a real one, you know? Teg's been a real one for us, and I'm just not going to play games with him and respect his wishes. And that that was very based of Lucilla. So Lucilla has a based response to that. As Duncan finishes up his exercises, Teg walks into the courtyard, and immediately Lucilla senses Teg is not Teg. That is a face dancer assassin with a laser gun. She warns Duncan by using the voice, but he's already sensed the danger and evades being blasted with a speed Lucilla's never seen before. So, you know, remember they told the Leiloxu to speed up his uh, his nerve Prada Bindu business because he's from, you know, he's like a 5,000 year old model. So they need to like kind of like tune him up. But it's like he's so tuned up that like Lucilla's like, holy shit, like I've never seen anybody this fucking fast before. She parkours down into the courtyard and the two of them advance on the cornered face dancer. But surprise, before they can get to him, its arm holding the gun is lasered off from behind by the real tag. 
she orders Duncan to, to smell that face dancer real quick to register the scent because this is one of the new face dancers. So like register the scent in your memory. So next time you come in contact with one, like you'll smell it and you'll know what the fuck. Uh, and they go back inside to Teg's quarters and there's another charred face dancer corpse inside stinking up the place with its cooked flesh. Lucilla's like, oh, God, I hate human flesh smell. Ugh, like cooked flesh. It's gross. Him and Patrin killed this one and they put the Bashar's uniform on him but set him face down to lure in the other face dancers who think that Teg's been killed and they're going to try to get a memory print of him. And uh, they disposed of the other face dancers as well. And at first, Lucilla is pissed. She's like, wait, wait, wait. You and Patron were fucking around with these face dancers instead of like coming to help like protect Duncan? Like, hello. And he's like, look, I would, you would have, sac I, I trust you. I know you would have sacrificed yourself for him if it came down to it. And I thought you guys could handle it. And you did. And Duncan's like, really? She would have killed, she would have died for me? No. And, and like, Tech's like, yeah. And Lucilla's like, yeah. Lucilla finally accepts his battle decision. She's like, well, he is right. <laughs> we did survive. And Patrin pulls up with Shuang Yu in tow, who's being a real bitch, trying to take control of the situation and get the Gola to go to her quarters. And Tech is like, nope, not really. And asks Lucilla to take Duncan into his sitting room while he argues with Shuang Yu. Uh, and while Lucilla and Duncan are in there, she notices that Teg does his own mending. He like, if he has like a little hole in his shirt, like he like sews it up himself, which is another based cute Teg, Tegism. They can hear the Bashar and the Reverend Mother arguing through the door. And Teg advises Shuang Yu not to return to her quarters. And Shuang Yu's like, why not? And Teg says, hold on one moment. And then there's an explosion. And then there's another explosion. And she's like, what the fuck was that? And he explains that the first explosion was one that he expected. That the Leiloxu, who she has partnered with, much like uh, Steros had partnered with the Leiloxu to assassinate Shiana, Shuang Yu, mirroring, has partnered with them to get rid of the Gola, and they have destroyed her, her quarters, trying to kill her, like they killed Steros, because they don't want anyone to know that they were involved, because they don't want the Bene Gesserit to come after them. Like they, like, they're like, no, like we we need to keep it like to where nobody knows, like so that's like in doubt, um, and no one can just like point the finger right at us. And the second explosion was him killing the attackers. So he knew they were gonna like turn on her, explode her shit. And so he had something planned for them to like get back. And uh, she doesn't believe him. She's And he's like, go look and see then. Go look and see. You know? <laughs> and she's so torn because she doesn't wanna let this Gola that she's trying to kill out of her sight. Um, but she has to know if the Leilox who double crossed her before she can decide what to do next. And Lucilla is amazed at Teg's ability to keep this Reverend Mother off balance. She's like, this man, this outsider, I mean, he's not an outsider, but you know, it's like he, this person is keeping a Reverend Mother off balance. Like, holy shit, Teg is something else. As soon as Shuang Yu leaves, Teg's plan of escape goes into action. Patrin stays behind to make sure no one follows Teg, Lucilla, and Duncan as they escape from the keep and into the night. And Lucilla's like, oh fuck, we're leaving? And he's like, yeah, we're leaving. She's like, okay, fine. <laughs> and uh, they are prepared to kill anyone who tries to stop them. So that is the end of session two. For session three, you're gonna wanna read pages 236 to 336. And the last sentence of the last chapter of session three is, in imagination, he saw her dead and her body awash in blood. Ooh. So let's get into questions and answers. But before we do that, I just want to remind all of you wonderful people, if you're enjoying Heretics of Doom Club and you want some of that sweet doom club merch we do have some final doom packs still available they do not have the books but they do have all the merch which includes a sticker sheet a uh Burbella cosplay bookmark a doom club magnet and three pens or you can get the pen without the alia option there's the saint alia of the knife option that we have in there 
because I didn't make a Children of Dune pen, so this is kind of a retroactive pen. People asked for it. I made a pen for every other club, so there's that. Plus, it's just super cool. But we also have a Church of the Divided God pen, and then a Desert Watch Center pen for uh, Chapter House, which we will learn more about in the winter time. There's also, this is our uh, cool magnet, and on the very back, you can't really see, but on the back, the Litany Against Fear is printed all around the back side of it. So uh, go to danicaxix.bigcartel.com if you want to get some sweet merch and support my scene. So thank you guys so much. We will be back for, oh goodness, <laughs> we will be back for session three next week. And now let's get into some questions and answers. 